Boom. Wow. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Keeps like going on. Music or something like we got a Dan. Come on, you're you're really. We gotta get some music going. There's gonna be a lot of. There's gonna be dancing in this uh, webinar. There's gonna be a lot of fun stuff. Um. So I'll, I'll just kick this off here. This is Adam Brenner. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Accelerate Yale. Uh, really excited to be in conversation today with Tom Lehman and uh, Dan Berger. Uh, I've known both of them for, for a long, long time. Dan and I were the, uh, the same class, uh, 2005 to date us from, uh, from Yale and Tom was a, a year younger. Uh, Tom is the co-founder and CEO of genius, uh, originally from Miami, he graduated magna cum laude from Yale with a dual degree in ethics, politics, and economics and math and math and philosophy. Before founding Genius, Tom worked as a programmer at D.E. Shaw in what must, must seem like a long, long time ago. Uh, he served as a keynote speaker and panelist at conferences, including Ruby, ConApp, DLD, and AppNexus. And Genius has been covered and written about in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New Yorker, uh, New York Times, and many other publications. And, and we're just really excited to, to have Tom here. Uh, Dan Berger. Uh, is one of the uh, co-founders of, of Triller, also an, and currently a co-founder of uh, Neon Coat. He has a decade-long career in technology um, and was one of the early employees uh, at Genius and its predecessor uh, named entity, Rap Genius. Um, he left Genius to join the founding team at Triller, which is in the news a lot right now, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that, which is a music video creation app that spawned many of the most popular viral dance challenges of the last five years. Um, and he's also currently on the influencer marketing platform, Neon Coat, which is currently operating in New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. So really excited to be in conversation with the two of you today. Uh, I think this is also a good follow-up to a, a webinar we did a couple of months ago, which uh, Zach O'Malley Greenberg spoke about the idea of creators having a different role um, and, and kind of gaining power both as investors as, um, and, and also changing their, their trajectory. Um, this is particularly relevant because the book talks about Nas as one of the early genius investors. But I uh, would love to kind of go way back in the past and hear kind of Dan and Tom, how you all started working together and kind of the launch of uh, Rap Genius. Dan, you got to do it. Dan, I would <laughs> say this. Dan one of my closest friends and an amazing giver of toasts. And uh, I had a micro wedding this year. Uh, the main wedding didn't happen because of COVID and Dan gave me a micro toast. It was a real toast, but it was over Zoom or whatever. It was a great little thing about how we met. So Dan, to say how we met. We, I was, you, you all probably remember the first week of college, you go to this uh, forum where all the groups are pitching the new students to join and I was, in a comedy group called Sweet 13. And I and I saw Tom who seemed like kind of a goofy guy and I tried to get him to join Sweet 13. And I think actually he showed up to one audition with his friend and then sort of- I wanted to show up to more auditions actually. <laughs> a couple, he made yeah, a little yeah, bit they, of way. They were working with a callback system at the time. So <laughs> between this and that. Yeah, so he didn't make the cut, but we still love him. And, and I, I thought he was a unique, even comic voice, and, and I wanted to be friends with him, so it's, uh, we were been friends ever since. Comedy is so important. Basically, I was obsessed with this HBO show called Mr. Show, and then I really sort of pushed a lot of that content on Dan uh, as my own content. And uh, <laughs> uh, remember, only under any circumstances, Dan? That's right. That was we don't have to get into that. We don't have to get into All that. Right. So... So anyway, so Tom, maybe maybe you could tell tell the folks a little bit though more about then fast forward how Genius started. I mean, I was someone involved, but you obviously were were more um, uh, at the genesis. Sure, cool. So yeah, so Genius um, used to be called Rap Genius. Obviously, talking about the origin, it's good, but I don't like to say like uh, you know a lot of people will say, oh, I've been a fan since it's Rap Genius. Like I don't love that because I don't want to look back. But sometimes it's fun to talk about the origin. Uh, and uh, this was an origin that was um, uh, basically 
kind of the convergence of two things. So one was at the time, like I was really interested in going to law school. I uh, basically, that was like my, my major, that was what I was into. I wrote my Yale senior paper on uh, eminent domain. So I was really into like law stuff. And I thought, okay, I work a little bit in New York, learned some technology stuff, started getting into it. And so I was like, wow, like I love to program. I have some ideas. And I basically was sort of trying to figure out, okay, how can I program 20 things? And one thing, well, this is again, like kind of like my whole life philosophy is you got to do a lot of stuff. So I was like, okay, how can I do a lot of things and see what sticks? But then simultaneously, I was having this experience of really getting into rap, really getting into lyricism to begin with. You know, I'm a, uh, uh, I'm from Miami, so I love to dance, but like lyricism was, was sort of, you know, secondary to me versus the beat. And I had, you know, my friends who were explaining to me uh, what rap lyrics meant and uh, the connections, the, the, the references that I would have missed. And I just had this experience of like, wow, this should be, this is amazing conversation. This is an amazing way to listen to music. It gets deeper. And, uh, um, and so I was like, well, you know, we were like, wow, like this could be a great website. Uh, you know, at this, at this point, you, you would view websites through what was called a laptop, which was like this unfolding thing. And so it actually, that was the first thing. It was a desktop, uh, uh, you know, a, a widescreen keyboard and mouse website, but then it kind of evolved and we got a mobile thing. And it was this project that was basically just fun. Uh, and then uh, it was uh, it evolved and it was like, whoa, like this could get big, like I can get paid to do this fun project. And then it became more, you know, like pretty serious. Now it's like very much about driving you know, you know, revenue and, 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 and so forth versus uh, uh, the early days when it was just about art, but still the core concept is the same. Uh, and that's what I love about this, no matter what changes with this company, with this project, the core concept says, and that concept is looking at music differently. It's about changing the way music sounds. Like, do you think music sounds the same way if the lyrics are in, you know, Italian and you don't know Italian versus you, it sounds different. And likewise, if you know the meaning of the lyrics, it will literally sound different. Dan, could you just, and then I'll stop talking, but can you show the duck rabbit, please? Okay, okay, I'm getting to it right now. Because this is the, my theory, my whole theory of life, which is my theory of art, my theory of entrepreneurship. Uh, all this basically comes down to this image, uh, which is, and, and then I'll really stop talking, but this image, which is, uh, if you look at it one way, it's a duck. If you look at it the other way, it is a uh, rabbit. And uh, you can see this is actually filtering it through. This is a conversation at AI. So, okay, this is AI, right? It's, it's taking uh, this image, rotating it, and then asking Google's cloud image recognition what it is. And so you can see here, it's the duck. Okay, here it's now more so the rabbit. There is no answer. And so when I look at a, at a song, you know, this is what genius is about. It is about taking, uh, uh, you know, the lyrics to a song are this. They could go either way. And that's what genius is about. And also I think entrepreneurship is very much about looking at a situation uh, for example, everything that's gone down this year and thinking, okay, this could be a big problem uh, or looking at it a different way, maybe it's an opportunity. So that's a duck rabbit and that's a little bit about genius. Cool. Thanks, Tom. So um, it just, so I was at Genius and then toward the end of my time at Genius, another friend of, Yaley friend of ours actually uh, named Dave, David, he, who was actually Tom's roommate. So maybe there was something in the Pearson College water or something. Uh, came to me with the idea for an app called Triller, and I thought it was very exciting. Basically, David had been working on a an app for Disney around Fro the movie Frozen, where the, it was for kids, and the kid would you would you would see the video of El Princess Elsa singing "Let It Go," and then a kid would sing along to it, and then the video you'd see at the end would be Princess Elsa doing her thing. And the audio is uh, the kid singing. Problem was, I mean, it was a successful app, but um, you know, artistically, the problem was the kids weren't very good singers. So you would end up with a video that even a parent, I'm a parent actually, uh, even a parent would be like, that's nice, okay. But didn't, no one else really wanted to see it. So um, David and I and, and some other collaborators thought about, well, what could, what could be kind of similar, but end up with a better product. So we decided to flip it, flip that frozen karaoke on its head and instead have the audio from the professional singer, say Drake, and the video provided by the user. And this actually- It's a video, of, basically. What's that? This is like a music video. Yes, it was a music video, yeah. So Tom actually has always said to me that when watching video, you think that it's, that it's the visuals that are more important, but it's actually the audio that's more important that makes something compelling. So 
even if you're a user and you don't have that much talent, I think everyone has talent, but you don't have that much talent and you show someone the video you made with Triller, at least they're listening to a Drake song. You know, it's, it's something good is, is coming out of this. And then, you know, people are creative. So we gave them tools to, to um, we used AI actually to allow them to, they did multiple takes and then the AI edits it, edits it for them. Kind of trying to mimic what a human editor would do. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's been, that took off as an app. It came out at the same, you know, somebody mentioned TikTok earlier, came out at the same time as TikTok's predecessor musically. And we were sort of neck and neck with them uh, for some time. And, and, you know, TikTok has gotten big, but now there are some threats, which we'll get, get to around that. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much the story of, of Triller. I do want to, before we dive into some of these things, uh, give people a little bit of an overview of uh, the music industry and that some background context of all that. Um, so let me just share my screen here. Um, again, one second. Okay, let me share my screen. This is just context for this whole conversation and the, and the music, music industry. So, okay, so this here is a uh, record store. If anyone, I don't know how old the people on this call are. What but, record store? Come on. Uh, HMV specifically, which you can recognize nice. from its iconic purple uh, background. So this is an HMV. This is where I or, you know, Tom probably were in the late 90s, you know, buying our music. And this is where everyone would buy their music. Uh, you'd buy CDs. And before that, you would buy um, cassette tapes. And before that, you'd buy records. And it was this whole physical distribution, um, you know, system. And so what are the dynamics of that? It was very top down. You'd have the major labels would sort of decide which music to be pushing this, you know, say the most classic example of this, what you might say would be NSYNC or something where it's just the label literally created, you know, the people created this, this um, group to, to sell records and what there did not come up from the bottom at all. So then those, uh, the labels would then decide what would get put in the record stores like an HMV or Virgin Records. There was a, a constraint at the record store level of physical limitation of how many CDs you can put on there, right? And who would decide what was put in there? It would you know, it'd be often the record store's relationship with the major label would um, decide what, what was in there. And there's some independent stuff. There's mic people, you know, giving mixtapes on the street and there's independent labels, but it was primarily this top-down thing. And then at the bottom of it was music fans. But if you were a music fan, it was likely your listening habits were very influenced by this sort of top-down structure. But now, talk about Lil Nas X he, with his hit uh, Old Town Road. So he's somebody who is a teenager in Georgia and posts this song on SoundCloud and you know, within a couple of months, he's got at this point of this screenshot, it was 18 million listens. He, you know, he eventually got hundreds of millions, and maybe it was a billion now. Um, I haven't checked, but that is a totally different. That ability to digitally distribute your music just fundamentally changes the relationship between artists and fans. And just you know, to the title of this talk, it's very music to the masses. It is very democratizing, and we'll get to some of the. Uh, democratize. But one thing I just want to point out here, I don't want to interrupt, but one thing I want to point out here is I think you're being a little, you know, this is good, but when you say put this song on SoundCloud, I just want to throw out there to everyone watching this and stop me if you've heard this before and there's a further reading thing later, but there is no such thing as a song. Okay. What it doesn't you? exist. There's a recording and there's a composition. Okay. Those are the only things that exist. So really what Lil Nas X did is uploaded this recording. Recording. Okay. But... Okay. No, it's a big difference though, because what about oh, the composition? That's true. The recording is royalty. Lil Nas X and that's whatever. Good. The composition is the people who composed it. Who sure, composed no, it? it who wrote that. it? Nine Inch Nails, right? Well, yeah. Wrote yes. The thing. Well, it, am I wrong, Dan? No, it's true, true. We're going to get to that in a sec, but-, but uh, I'm chiming in, no? Okay, no, 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 no. We'll get, we'll get to this. that in a sec. Uh, they wrote the, uh, uh, the beat, part of the beat, and so, you know, you think about this for a second, SoundCloud is not only about Lil Nas X, right? It's about Nine Inch Nails getting their first number one hit. 
So that's why you have to yeah. think about recording versus composition, because you look at this and you think this is about Lil Nas X and the recording, but it's also about the composition, which is also a game that's totally changed. So that's my choice. No, that's a good point. No, I was, I was going to get to that, but the the uh, the it's an interesting story. I'll just stop for a second and talk about this because it's it's a very interesting story. Um, Lil Nas X, and it has to do with the democratization of music. Lil Nas X created, you know, did the lyrics to Old Town Road, but then he bought the beat actually for thirty dollars on a website called Beat Stars, and he bought it from a kid in the Netherlands, who was another teenager in the Netherlands and for $30 on BeatStars. So that's just an amazing way that that um, music is much more democratized now that these two you know, teenagers across the world ended up collaborating on this hit song. Now, context for the, for the beat, it was actually sampling, the beat was sampling a Nine Inch Nails uh, record from uh, the 90s that uh so so you know there were three collaborators in this it's just that's all very indicative of of like where how, how music has changed in in the sort of tech era um let me finish let me finish that um one second and then we'll get to we'll get to some other stuff um so okay so yeah so this is this is talking about so now it's very much more uh bottom up you know the artists through tech platforms like SoundCloud, like uh, Spotify, like Genius, like TikTok, like Triller, um, reach the music fans more directly. You know, the, the, the tech platform, we can talk about how the tech platforms play a role, but it's not the same thing of uh, these, the labels and, the, um, and the, the record stores being these intermediaries. The tech platforms are much easier for the artists to gain a following, reach their fans directly. And we'll talk about all that, but that's, you know, one of the fundamental things. Last thing on this, and then we'll, we'll move on to some other stuff, but about the business of this, uh, you know, royalty, the royalty money that, that artists get used, there used to be more money. I put this on here, the 15 to $20 CDs. That was a great uh, business to be in printing CD, you know, uh, selling a CD for 15 to $20 which was the price at the end of the CD era was a great business. It only costs under a dollar to create a CD. Um, you know, now with Spotify, the, the total, you know, royalties is, are, are, are a bit less streaming, you know, it just brings in slightly less money, but there's still a lot of money in streaming, but a lot of it's going to Spotify. Uh, just as an example of, of a platform, you know, an artist only gets uh, 0.4 cents per stream. So they're trying to get more, but it's not, it's not, even if you're pretty successful, you have to be very successful to make a lot of money at 0.4 uh, cents per stream. So now it's led to a lot of alternative revenue streams like, um, you know, Chance the Rapper has this streetwear line. One thing I will chime on real quick though, is just to be clear, that 0 0.004 dollars, 0.4 cents, uh, which is not exactly, it's like a rev share thing, but like that's, that's, you know, my understanding is that is like what the artist sees, whereas the 15 to 20 dollars on CDs, that's the right. retail price. So the better, I think, way to consider it would be, you know, seven, half of that or something like that. But still, the, the point, uh, uh, sorry. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it back in the day, the artist used to get like 10 percent of the, the royalties. But so um, so anyway, it's not it, it's you have to be very successful to um, just sit back on your laurels and make money on, on off of Spotify streams. So most people. Most artists now have other revenue streams. You could start a merch line. That's that's one. You know, Chance the Rapper is a good example of that. Um, another thing is touring, which gets to something Tom is going to share with us. But you know, touring has taken on a lot of importance now because uh, of the the just trying to think of new ways to make money because the um, revenues aren't there in the way that they were during this, the, the CD of just purely selling music are not quite there. So touring in the last you know five, 10 years has become uh, an even bigger business than it ever was. Now, of course, COVID hit and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom to talk about, you know, Genius actually has been involved in um, some interesting stuff around pivoting touring, given that, you know, we can't all meet up in, a, in Barclays Center now. Got it. Uh, so let me uh, let me share the genius live slides. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So this is uh, um, this is uh, 
Dan, just for a moment, would you show the duck rabbit again, please? <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> Quickly, that's the only way to set the stage for this. Okay, where is that? There you go. There it is. So basically, uh, COVID this year, uh, from a genius perspective, uh, you know, was very much a duck or the bad one in terms of you know creating challenges for us. But uh, you know, this and I can talk more about this if you, if you want. But in terms of like the approaching the situation like COVID. Uh, no one wants to hear, you know, it's, it's like you have to do damage mitigation, damage control to mitigate problems, but, you know, fixing problems is never going to, to, to get you out as much as, as, as figuring out new opportunities. And so we really started to think, okay, could we view this as a rabbit? Could we view this as a good thing? Can we figure out a way to help artists make money during the pandemic situation and then build something of lasting value such that even in the future, it will still be a good thing. It won't be the only thing as it is now live streaming that is. Uh, but it'll be a good thing. And so we sort of sat down and thought, what is special about the live performance experience that we can translate uh, to a live stream, but also what are we not trying to do? We are not trying to give people an alternative because there's no way to have the alternative. You have to come up with an approach that fits the format. And so when we were thinking about Genius Live, then if you advance the Genius Live slide, just the heading. Uh, yeah, so when we were thinking about Genius Live, uh, we were trying to figure out a way to make live performance work with the sort of established norms of live streaming, uh, live streaming on Twitch in particular in the gaming context. And so the main thing we were thinking here is there is no way you can have a compelling live stream without constant uh, person to person, you know, constant two way interaction. Basically any music live stream, in my opinion, where the artist is sitting there and playing a song to the camera, the camera's pointed at them and not moving. It does not work. It is not like real life live in that way. So that was one thing. Uh, and then the other thing was the notion that unlike gaming, the live performance experience, you have to have a collaborative experience with the fans. It can't just be artist fan one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that, that does not work in the same way it can with, with gaming. And so these were kind of the insights that we were working with and we came up with Genius Live. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little about what it is. So this is like a little bit of a uh, sizzle in a way that shows the first event that we had which was with, with Khalifa, as you can see. Uh, and so what you can see here uh, is on the right side, uh, there are various ways in which the audience can pay money to control what goes on on stream. This is the two-way interaction thing. This is the monetization element. That was another part of our thing, which is like, you know, you can't compete with Instagram Live unless you are going to monetize because Instagram Live is such an amazing live streaming thing for all kinds of music. And the biggest disadvantage is you can't monetize. So you get a question, you get a shout out, you can vote on the set list. Uh, and then crucially, you can join the watch party, which was like the person to person thing. So, you know, the watch party, like, as you can see in the top left, maybe you go to the next slide, please, Dan. You know, this is kind of the, the breakout, right? So you got the watch party, you pay $10, you appear on stage, the artist comes uh, afterwards and talks to you, you can vote, you can get a shout out, you can ask a question. And then on our next show, we actually created a collective reward, as we called it, where if fans contributed and tipped and, and bought enough stuff uh, above a certain threshold, the artist would actually play an unreleased song. So that's like a real piece of energy about like, wow, like this show is something unique and I have control over it as a fan. And so this is, you know, in our view, an absolutely necessary thing right now, business-wise for Genius, obviously, because we do a lot of events, we can't do them now. It's also absolutely essential for artists, but we think this is going to go beyond this year uh, and form a new revenue stream, you know, a revenue stream that artists can unlock anywhere uh, uh, in the world. This is kind of like, you know, from a, uh, a duck rabbit standpoint, how to turn this whole thing into you know, some kind of uh, uh, opportunity, even as it has caused, you know, obviously so much, you know, destruction. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, this to Dan's point, you think about how you make money, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to make money performing, but what about, uh, can I make money as a streamer? Now we're getting really a little bit away from it. You think about something like Cameo, can I make money from Cameo? Does that even have anything to do with performance or music? And so, you know, this is, uh, 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 this is a really powerful thing because, you know, the internet has democratized so much in terms of music, uh, but it's also democratized so much in terms of what it means to be a, uh, a musician, a celebrity. Like you need to really be thinking about the entire universe of your fan interactions. Like people want access like never before. And so, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, another play in that area. One of the things we did this year, uh, but I think a, a really important thing to watch for, and even if it's not genius, which is a tough playing field, by the way, I'm trying to be you know, humble here, like we're up against Twitch, you know, music live streaming is not going uh, anywhere, even though I'm fairly confident that every live stream that you see, that's just a camera pointed 
uh, uh, at a performer. I don't think that's going to work, but like something, maybe it's not this, but this is not going anywhere, even post COVID. Cool. Yes, rev share with the artist. Um, um, so, yeah, actually, just speaking of that, if you could, if you could um, speak to, you know, one of the interesting things, again, uh, talking about democratizing and, and music to the masses is the way that Genius in particular has, uh, you know, other platforms too, Twitter or whatever, I think Genius is the best at this, made music into a two-way conversation between artist and fan. And, you know, so talk, you know, there's, there are forums on Genius, there's a leaderboard on Genius. There's also, you know, oftentimes in these verified videos where you ask, you know, you ask the artist, what did you mean? Or what do you have to say about this lyric? They might comment on the, the uh, user's attempt at understanding their uh, lyric. I think TI may be correct in one of my annotations, if I recall correctly, but if you could speak to all that. Yeah, no, I mean, for sure. You know, I think Genius is, this is something that we think about a lot in terms of how we could do stuff differently in the future. I think Genius is very known, of course, for the game aspect where anyone can uh, contribute a meeting, anyone can contribute. We call them annotations, sort of a nerdy word, which I don't like, but it gets the meaning across. Anyone can contribute an annotation, anyone can add a song. If you contribute a good annotation or a popular song, you get all the lyrics right, uh, you'll get points. And then there's the leaderboard. And so it's this big game. You know, this is another big learning from uh, games. So Twitch obviously inspired Genius Live. Games, that's my advice, is that you have to make everything a game somehow and look to gaming culture because gaming culture and games are always on the edge because of how we're wired as like lizards, you know, like uh, sure. the dogs, you know, they salivate. It actually would have been better if it was inconsistent that there'd be food. They would have salivated more, I, I heard from psychology uh, stuff. But what you don't know is that when you have this game, People also want to just hang out with like-minded people. You know, that's the other aspect because you want to win the game, but it's not just winning the game. It's like, who's else is in the winner circle here? How can I hang out? You know, uh, many things have happened in this vein, but one, since we mentioned Old Town Road, you know, Lil Nas X, you know, Lil Nas X posted his first music on the site. There's a forum post where uh, he's saying, I'm doing music now, uh, not just annotating. And I go by the name uh, Lil Nas X and here's a song, what do you all think? And uh, you know, what I really want to just emphasize there is it's not just about a two-way conversation between fans and artists. It's like, what is a fan and what is an artist, basically? Right. You know, democratization, everything, like anyone who is a fan could be the next artist. And we want that whole thing to be able to happen uh, uh, on Genius. You know, the dream with something like Genius Live is anyone can sign up, anyone can use it. Right. There'll be someone right. who doesn't consider themselves an artist. They'll get on the platform, you know? So I think it's, yeah. it's, it's not just democratizing there, it's the blurring. Yeah, that actually reminds me. Yeah, there's you know there's some amazing things. I met, we mentioned Lil Nas X uh, and his like collaboration uh, through technology. You know, there's other things going on. I mean, um, Brock Hampton is this rap collective that came together in a Kanye West uh, for online forum. That's pretty cool. But then about producers, you Which know, forum? what's that? What forum? I forget. It was a Kanye West forum. Uh, I forget. But probably Kanye to the you Kanye to the maybe maybe it was that. Um, so you know why it's called oh, that? Never mind. Okay. So, uh, so the, but about, about, uh, creation, Tom's getting at the importance of, of how technology has empowered so many more people to become artists themselves. You know, it used to be again, in, you know, in the old days of, around the time of the HMV, uh, era, you would have to have a physical, if you want to be a producer, you'd have to have a physical machine, you know, a, a, a beat machine to make any uh, beats and, and, and you know, you have to put samples in through that physical machine. Now with technology, you know, there's Pro Tools, those, there's Ableton, there are all these things. And Tom, maybe we'll, we'll show you, we'll show Genius's own contribution to this, but it has just made it so that producers, so many more people are producers now. And there's a whole, you know, the Lil Nas X thing is just a good example, but there's a whole uh, economy of buying beats and they're categorized some, you know, people say, like a type beat, like uh, you would do a Migos type beat as you do a beat that kind of sounds like a Migos song. And so that's just an amazing thing. And, and you know, again, it doesn't matter where you are. You're, uh, you know, you could be in Atlanta, which is a big hip hop city, but you could be in the Netherlands. There aren't that many, you know, Dutch rappers. You could be in Korea, you could be in Ghana, it doesn't matter. So uh, that's very cool. And actually Tom, and Genius have actually contributed to that a bit. Let me share my screen about the um, the uh, Genius Home Studio. 
Right. So this was another thing that we tried to duck rabbit from from COVID, which was basically, you know, building on uh, what Dan is saying in terms of collaboration and everything that we have with the site and also thinking about, OK, online learning and how that's, you know, for now, the only game in town. But even after this, it's going to be bigger than it was before. And even before it was pretty big. And you think about like a master class type thing. And so we wanted to uh, basically think, how can we build on the energy that already exists? but also double down on this area of education because of uh, what's going on and to really empower people. So yeah, show me, show the, show the image, if you would, please. Yeah. So this is basically a program that we launched. It's called Home Studio. Uh, it was in uh, collaboration with HP and we're gonna be launching the version that's new, the uh, V2, uh, uh, very soon. So everyone should check it out and participate. Dan, you gotta pull it up. I gotta, I gotta show them, I gotta say the interface. What's that? That show the home studio slide, no? No, is it not is it not shown? It's not shown. Okay, Dude, you gotta share the screen. Hold you on. were doing such a good job. You're yeah, still doing I, it. I, I think it got uh it got uh taken out there. Okay, here we go. Perfect. So uh so this is the this is the interface. Uh now you look at this and there's a name for this type of software, I forget, digital audio studio, something like this, right? And so part of this is pretty basic in the sense that we want to create an excellent online tool for making a beat. And there's a bunch of actually YouTube videos you could watch where people are like playing with this and saying, this is so cool and whatever. And, and I love that. Uh, but that's just technology. Genius is always about how can we take technology and combine it with, you know, artistry, with the liberal arts, with everything and, and, and get something transformative. And so to me, the key killer feature on this uh, is you can see that submit button in the uh, right side uh, thing. Uh, the second thing from the top on the right side, that's the submit button. And that I think is the game changing button uh, when it comes to online uh, music education, because it's not just education in the abstract, right? Learning something. It's like, I want to do something real. Uh, I want to make something happen. I want to submit. And so what could submit mean? Like this is new. What could submit mean? For us, this was a promotional campaign first because we wanted to make a splash. We work with HP. So for us, it was winning a contest. So you submit and you can actually look this up and you get mentorship from an artist. I, you'll, you'll, there was like a producer component and a lyricist component. And basically you submit your beat and you would get a mentor. You would win a mentorship session. Uh, in the future, yes, you're robot overlords. In the future, this could be submit and, you know, forget a, a famous artist. Maybe I submit and we, you know, you collaborate, it, it, it releases it in, 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 you know, among a group of people who are, you know, at your kind of stage of, of development, you can find friends to collaborate with, you can find, you know, who knows, Genius Records, maybe you submit this uh, and Genius signs you. So it's, it's a broader concept here, but it's basically building, it's kind of uniting the idea of, uh, uh, you know, online learning and online tooling and democratization of that with the ability to uh, collaborate in a real way, which something Genius, Genius provides. And also, you know, on top of that, with the idea that like, look, like Genius Live is about making money if you are a performer, right? How do you make money if you are a producer? You can't really, I mean, you can use Genius Live for something else, but you don't perform. This is another way you can think about that. Oh, I'm getting everyone asking me to check out their music, submit, maybe I uh, can get paid for that. As a producer, someone can submit their beat. I can get paid to give them feedback. We didn't do that because it was sponsored, but that could be the future of this. So, you know, again, duck rabbit and trying to combine multiple disciplines and looking at where music is going. Cool. We're Very close cool. to out of time, um, Dan. I just want to make sure I show GPT-3. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, just quick thing I do want to touch on because the, of the name of this about AI. Um, you know, AI is interestingly uh, a bit of a democratizing force because you know the decisions, and TikTok's a great example. And you know I've studied TikTok a lot as sort of our big competitor. You know when, when I was working most on on Triller, and you know the the their great insight was this algorithm where they they would look at what was performing well on the platform, and then regardless of who you follow, you know Facebook had this had this whole in, insight into the uh, social graph that. You know, okay. Oh, you want to you want to see content from your friends, and then maybe they'll suggest if they you know if they think something would appeal to you, they'll just suggest it in the explore page. You know, say on Instagram or something, right? In in the uh, TikTok model, they just show you the content, even though you don't follow them. They they just look at what is performing best on on the platform and serve it to everyone. It's just you know, and and you know, there's some curation based on what you like, but it's like it doesn't matter. You don't have to follow that person. 
And that I think was a great insight and a real democratizing insight is just the best content wins. And so that, and you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of TikTok, even though also a competitor of TikTok, uh, that I think is an amazing force that, that's happening right now in, in music tech. And in fact, you know, when this whole, somebody mentioned earlier, but this whole TikTok and the US government thing happened, ByteDance, the, the Chinese parent company was most interested in protecting the algorithm because they knew that was what was powering all this. Um, Tom can speak to other other things. I know you take you you keep an eye on what's going on on TikTok and Triller and other platforms to just make decisions, but you also yes. had a cool uh, GPT-3 thing you wanted to show. Yeah, let's do the GPT-3 thing. But first, t say the further reading thing. Oh, did I not show that? Sorry, that's <laughs> too wild. Okay, okay, T uh, Tom thinks it's very important that we uh, I show this he uh, read a book that um, that if you're interested in particular in the in the business of music, uh, you know we're talking about some things that sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's more of just cultural creative. If you're interested in the business uh, of music, you should read this book. I feel like I'm a lecturer at Yale here. Further reading, uh, all you need to know about the music business by Donald S. Passman. You can buy it on Amazon or anywhere you buy books. Yeah, I would just say you have to read this book if you care about any of this stuff at all. I'll put okay, it in like Very rarely in life can you just say, oh, like, what's the right thing? Let me read a book. Like, often it's like, no, you got to, like, do whatever. You got to learn it yourself. So when you have the opportunity to read a book that just tells you everything works, uh, you know, why did it take me, like, 10 years in the music business? Anyway, let me show you GPT-3. This is the last. Can you see this? Yeah. You see the GPT-3? Okay, got it. So does anyone here know what GPT-3 is? So basically GPT-3 is, you can kind of think of it as a text completion service. So you give it text and then it completes it based on like, you know, what else happens on the internet with Markov chains or something. Anyway, the point being, this is like cute AI that's not actually smart. There's no actual mental model of the world that goes on with this text completion thing. It's not actually thinking about stuff and writing it. It's just completing it, but it can be cute. So here's a fun demonstration. So this is the stuff I'm typing in, okay? I am typing in, I am a respected folk singer. I, oh, there we go. I did I. Uh, I have been excited to sing a song for a group of important thinkers. Here are lyrics I have sung in the past. So imagine that you are just seeing this written down, you have to complete it. So here are some lyrics. So Tangled Up in Blue, okay, like a Rolling Stone, okay, and then I'm gonna put the new song. Dan put Mountain Dew, but come on, let's put something for, for you know, why hack um, or yell, yell, uh, uh, accelerate. Let's say, uh, uh, um, you know, so right, yeah, let's see. Let's see what pops out. This could also end up being vulgar. We'll see. <laughs> Warning. Okay, so we got, uh, okay, so you see this is like, uh, okay, this is getting a little crazy. So you see this, uh, now this is our song in the style of, of Bob Dylan called Accelerate, uh, Yale, which is again, written not by an AI in the sense you think, but just by looking at stuff. So let's let's do a different one. Let's say like, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, ode. That's an elegy to. Is that how it's been? Oh, New Haven. Let's try this. So you can just write song lyrics now without worrying about any of this stuff. Okay, I'll do one more, and then we can sh sh shift it over. What should be, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, thanks for all the laughs. Uh, my friend, Dan Berger. All right, Dan, here's your song. Oh, wow. I'm a deep purple rain cloud over the hill. Maybe purple yeah. rain reference. I'm a candle in the wind. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is the song about Dan. Okay, that's that's it for OpenAI. Uh, well, well, thank you guys so much. I, I think this is kind of really fascinating. We wanted to jump over to some of the questions in here. Um, I guess we'd start out with um, with Ben Christensen, and Ben was asking, kind of, how do you think? What do you think about kind of cross collaborations? Like, would you all collaborate with a, you know, Fortnite slash Genius 
or TikTok slash genius um, to, to keep uh, thinking through broadening audiences um, and platforms kind of working together. I know that, for instance, Genius has worked with Spotify, right? Um, and partnered with them. But do you see those as productive relationships? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because a bunch of different things. So TikTok, we are absolutely, you know, we have a very large TikTok presence and uh, we are obsessed, you know, with TikTok as a way to reach audience and find new people to work with. So like we find an artist based on our analysis of what's going on on TikTok. We work with that artist, then we release content on TikTok, and it kind of keeps going and going and going. Uh, we also did a, an ad campaign for TikTok uh, this uh, uh, year, which was a different way to collaborate. So that's amazing. Uh, but it, it uh, uh, it's different from the Fortnite Roblox thing. That thing is really interesting, and I really just want to like, because this is again what I was saying right about gaming. You look at gaming, okay? Why is it that the best live streams are in games, right? That's a little weird, right? So I think that is you know, we're not, I think, looking specifically to collaborate in their area. We would, and that could be a cool thing we're doing, but we're not trying to get into gaming, but we're trying to learn from gaming. And I, we're trying to build the first good live stream of music that's not in a game, uh, which really has not happened. The Travis Scott Fortnite thing. And Lil Nas X Roblox thing, I should know more about that. Like, I know that that happened and everything, but like the Travis Scott Fortnite stuff, uh, you know, both in terms of the format and the ability to monetize with the virtual goods and everything so, so, so far in the future in terms of this stuff. So uh, definitely open to collaborating, but also just trying to, you know, steal the ideas basically because I think that game. I just want to, yeah, I just want to chime in about um, Fortnite. Yeah, that this kid, um, you know, in, uh, his name was Russ. I met this kid about four years ago at a, at a creator conference called Playlist Live. His name was Russell. He was this sort of weird, intense, uh, skinny kid, and he had a backpack all the time. And he was doing this dance, and I thought it was kind of cool. And uh, you know, I didn't think anything of it. A few months later, he's going viral on Instagram with the floss dance. He has millions of followers. A few months after that, he's on SNL with Katy Perry. A few months after that, Fortnite actually puts the floss dance in Fortnite. And then he got into some sort of lawsuit with them about whether the intellectual property of that or, but um, so I, you know, that opened my eyes to the c connection between music, social media, gaming that, you know, basically like Gen Z is just doing in a, a combined that, you know, that these distinctions, Tom is a millennial like me, but, but has sort of a Gen Z kind of mentality of like, why are we making Hi. No, it's true. But why are we making these distinctions of, oh yeah, this person's an artist, this person's a fan, this is all about gaming, but this is about music. You know, I think the way that Gen Z sees things is more like, this is all a blend of things and, and that's cool. Yeah. Tom, that, that, the floss dance, do the floss dance, come on. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's very good, he's very good. <laughs> So I think I think this might be a first time for an Excel Yale that we actually get some some dancing in here. And I think it's something that we want to uh, replicate going forward. Um, Here's another thing I'd say about live stream, by the way. Do you see the quality of this camera that I'm dealing with right now? I don't. I'm not trying to like uh, 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 you know brag or whatever, but this wasn't like just some random thing that happened. So I would just say anyone out there who's doing Zoom a lot, think about the quality of the camera setup you have and all this kind of stuff. Like that's very, very important. If you go on Twitch and again, look at the gamers, look at the future, what you will see is a lot of high quality cameras. And so that's another thing to really think about. Look at gaming, look at what cameras people use on Twitch and use them. Yeah. So, so can you all speak a little bit about the idea of how you work with these artists or creators? Like what are the, obviously, you know, Tom, you just walked through a new program where people can become that producer, but how much information are you sharing with them? Are you making them smarter, you know, creators, smarter business people, changing their entrepreneurial relationship? I think if you are working with an artist, you have to be thinking about making them money from the job, which is not to say, oh, like, let's only focus on thing. You know, you don't want to say it like that, but like, let's be honest, like people need to make money. And so, you have to look at things, you know, through that, through that lens to figure out how it's going to, to work. So one obvious way is promotion, right? So a lot of the stuff we do is not like a monetary transaction, uh, but it is uh, in promotion of something. That's the easiest way to, to work with someone. Uh, but then you have to think, why are they promoting this? When are they promoting this? Who else are they working with? So you have to think about that. But then 
you really have to go beyond that, I think, if you're trying to build these real relationships long term. Uh, you know, you have to be thinking about how to get them paid directly. So it all works together. So obviously Genius Live is a platform where there's an artist payment component, but even pre that, you know, we're always thinking about working with advertisers and how we can take that partnership with an advertiser and then get an artist paid and then work with the artist again and all this kind of stuff, like building these relationships. So I'd say absolutely, uh, this needs to be something you are, are thinking about. Uh, we want to be a platform where you can go to connect with your fans and talk about artistry and, you know, really get something you can't get anywhere else. Uh, from a spiritual and like subject matter basis, we want to deliver that, but like you got to be realistic. You got to be thinking about how you can help the people you work with economically. Yeah, just just to build on what what Tom said, that's very much what we the, the mentality at Triller. You know, it started off being like, okay, what can we promote? What can we offer these people? And it would be promotion. You know, maybe your song is the number one song in the in the list of songs that people can can choose to make videos to. But you know, it's a very competitive environment, and and. It's constantly changing, but it, you know, you're competing with Snapchat, you're competing with Instagram, you're competing with TikTok, you're competing with all these different platforms. So you definitely need to be off differentiating yourself by offering money. And you know, so like Genius um, and and uh, Terrence here mentioned Mike Liu, who's the current uh, CEO of Triller. You know, he realized that this uh, and and added, you know included artists in in those uh, brand campaigns the influencer campaigns and then also made a uh, button for fans to be able to pay the creators and and um, that's become basically table stakes for any live uh, platform is uh, fan to cre uh, fan to creator payments yeah so uh, I'm, I'm jumping into the question from T sledge uh, and, and also, uh, the Eric Drury question that we have here, because I, I think there, there is some overlap. Um, how do you focus on quality of your platforms? Like what, and the quality of the outputs coming onto them? Like, is, is there just a goal where anyone can access this as true democratization, or are you trying to work with those creators to actually create uh, um, higher quality content that will actually be able, they'll be able to monetize, or is it just something fun? I think like some of the Triller model is, this is just fun to do, but then some people are making tons and tons of money on this. Um, and, and, and kind of in that same way, you know, Ed, Eric had asked about how, how far are we away from kind of online live collaboration with no real latency? The question is, how quickly are you kind of building out these tools to support a certain brand of creator versus someone who's just wanting to do that Elsa video, uh, Dan, and just have some fun with their kids. Right, right. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. You know, are you a platform? Are you a publisher? You know, everyone wants to kind of be both. I think the way I have always found is the best way to do things is you start out in a way that is more uptight and not scalable. Uh, and then you make it more scalable and less uptight and you come up with systems. With the website, genius.com, initially, you had to be invited to join. It wasn't a crowdsource platform. And we worked on that for a while, learned a lot, and then opened it up. Now, you also have to figure out your theory because with crowdsourcing, you kind of want there to be problems a little bit. You know, the best way to get the right answer on the internet is to not say, you know, how do you print in, you know, Mac? You say, it sucks that you can never print in Mac. And someone say, you idiot, here's how you print. So there's something like that. Likewise, with Genius Live, what we're thinking about is like, in the beginning, how can we work very closely with an artist, work out the kinks in the system, get something that really works technologically speaking. And then you say, okay, anyone can join. And then you sort of like deal with those problems. But uh, there's no, you know, there's no great uh, solution. You're always going to be dealing with the same tensions. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what Tom said that you, um, can, you know, starting, starting with some of the, maybe you would call it the more talented people and then expanding to the, uh, the masses or whatever, because with Triller, we found it's so, um, you know, the backpack kid and the floss dance is a great example, is the perfect example of a viral dance phenomenon. You know, Gen Z culture also like looks to, it's it's about sort of you, you copy what someone else is doing. You do your version of what someone else is doing, but you do need a little guidance from those influencers, for lack of a better word, who are maybe, whether they're more talented or just more outgoing or whatever, um, and TikTok, to their credit, did a good job of this, realizing that you want to get the influencers and the, the talented creators on the platform. And then and then the second step is that the masses can do their own version of it. 
Uh, it's not pure, you know, you want it to be like a conversation in two way. It's not pure, just, oh, the, it, the creator is really talented and does it. And then the, uh, the masses just view it. It's more the masses do their own version of it. That's really, when you have a real viral dance, you know, phenomenon going on as the, the, the floss dance was, Tom's being the best version of it. Uh, you know, that's what happens is that, is that everyone, yeah, everyone saw Russell, the backpack kids version, but they also did their own version. And that's when you, you know, and that, that by the way, started very much on Trello. Um, you know, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you, the, the kind of old line services or even the new line kind of major corporations like Spotify are, are working and responding to you all. Um, we have this question from, uh, from Angle Bush, who is, who is raising kind of the, this notion of like, are they playing with you? Are they realizing that there's this huge wave that they need to participate in? Or are they still kind of resisting the growth of kind of innovative tech that's led by, uh, by creators? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very interesting, you know, situation. You know, I think that like, you know, one thing just to point out is that like, Spotify is a, you know, a streaming thing. It's not like a music thing. And so, you know, they do music, of course, but they also are very heavily invested in podcasts. And so, you know, if you are singularly obsessed with music, like Genius, you are never going to be a perfect overlap with an overarching, you know, streaming uh, uh, service. And so that uh, gives you advantages and disadvantages, you know, so I think we are, uh, uh, um, you know, we are always going to, there's going to be a partial overlap there always. And so we, we work with Spotify and the stuff that we're really good at, but we don't, you know, uh, 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 we don't work with them in, in, in every part of what they're doing priority wise in the same way we would, you know, if they were a pure music company, you know, I think when it comes to the industry, you know, it's like A&R, you know what I mean? Like, that's a good way to think about it. Like who that's the, what would you, how would you define A&R Dan? <laughs> um, yeah, it's really, that is, the sort of discovery, uh, you know, uh, discovery and and growing of new acts, basically for a music label is, is A and R. Right, and so that I think is the best thing to think about because who is doing A and R right now and who's talking to whom? Like that's the, the internet is. This is what, what I didn't get to actually. The internet is doing A and R for the labels. That's really what's going on, um, which is very interesting. And and again, democ you know, because some of the people we've talked about, Chance the Rapper, no, has not gone with a major label, but other people, Lil Nas X, for example, actually ended up signing, he had all this independent success that he created himself through technology platforms and his relationship with the fans, but then did sign with a major label, Columbia. And, you know, Columbia noticed that that was happening, has money, you know, personally, I think music labels, not a great business to be in right now and are declining, but they do still have a lot of money, still have marketing dollars to put behind people. So, you know, they are looking at, they just looked at what's bubbling up. It, it's very bottom up. They saw what, that Lil Nas X was bubbling up and they gave him a record deal. So the internet is the new A&R. Yes. Um, so one question that Terrence raised was about kind of the, the crossover of the uh, a, a different kind of creator platform, uh, OnlyFans, and how that, that, that model, does it, does it translate over any lessons to kind of the super fan phenomenon um, that, that could come over to music in the world that you all are interacting in. Definitely. I mean, you know, I mentioned gaming is in the future. Uh, I would also say OnlyFans is in the future. Uh, what is OnlyFans exactly? Does something to do <laughs> with pictures? No, but, yeah, the, the broader <laughs> point, I think, I, I think the broad point is, is basically, and this is happening in every industry, every like digital media industry, Substack is a good example, is like a, a um, example in media is uh, you know, in, in written uh, content is uh, gating content behind a paywall and it's I think that that probably will happen in music I'm curious what Tom thinks but that that seems like a way to go when you have a passionate it's the you know the fundamental thing is you have a passionate fan base you can get them to pay five dollars a month ten dollars you know who knows but Tom maybe could speak to that too yeah I think it's just taking the lessons and adapting them I don't know if the subscription thing works in the same way People already subscribe to Spotify, you know, sure. so it's a little different maybe in that regard, in other regards. But I think looking at OnlyFans and saying, how can I pay this person to do something? Uh, how can I have some kind of control over the situation and pay for it? I think that's absolutely something to, to look at. Uh, OnlyFans and Twitch are not so different, really. They're the same thing, actually. Like, Twitch has subscribers, OnlyFans does. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm a, big, I'm a big fan 
uh, uh, and um, you know, Substack just seems like blogger to me, but like, I love bloggers. So but behind a paywall though. Is behind the key. a paywall, I mean, I guess, you know, so I, 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 I'm not sure I quite understand the, the Substack thing, but I think uh, uh, it's blowing up. So I probably should understand it better. Uh, but yeah, I think all these things are, are, are fundamentally uh, touching the same. So, so just kind of to, to wrap this up, um, anything that uh, you all are seeing as, as kind of trends that we all should be looking out for, things that you're really excited about other than the, the new launches from Genius, where you think uh, we could be surprised on, on the direction that things are, are going in the, uh, in the music industry and, and with AI or just generally? I do want to mention just just on the concert thing, um, you know, AR and VR. That's sort of the big. In addition to AI, those are those are sort of some of the big trends in tech, right? Just in tech generally right now. And I think, you know, COVID has made me think about the possibility of a you know a, a more involved virtual concert where you feel like you're actually there. That I think that kind of thing could definitely um, become popular and and and. Uh, make someone a lot of money and uh, yeah, and just more, more involved collaboration. You mentioned Adam, uh, some live collaboration thing. I think stuff like that is coming down the pipeline where the, the, instead of it's like, oh, you upload a beat and then later asynchronously someone gets the beat and raps over it. Maybe it's all happening together. You know, that, that kind of stuff. I think that's right. I would also think about, um, I'm not so bullish on VR. I mean, I'm not anti anything, but just to the extent that like any spiritual exercise of trying to replicate the in-person concert experience, I don't think is the right approach. I think it should be a separate thing. You know, I think that uh, VR could also be good, but if we're trying to think, okay, how do we replicate it? I don't think it should be try to replicate it. You know, another thing I would just put out there is fashion, merch. Okay. Dan mentioned this a little bit, but like, you know, products. Okay paying an artist for something, a product, you know what I mean? Like what is next uh, there? That's something we have all, you know, we're, we're working on at Genius 2, which is like, you know, we're talking about Genius Live, like, yes, there's the Twitch style thing, but how can we supplement this? Like a merch collab, this thing, can we bundle, bundle this? But like, you know, artists launching products, artists launching merch, like this is another big. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all about the McDonald's collaborations. McDonald's, yeah. that's the highest profile uh, <laughs> version for sure. And uh, by Dre, you know, I'll be saying that. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you both for, for all your time. I think this has been uh, really fascinating. Um, we'll, uh, we'll kind of jump back to Wendy here, but, uh, and this will also be available for people to look at after the fact and see how Tom's camera is much better than mine and uh, dance. <laughs> I love it. Hi everyone, I'm not going to come on screen, but my name is Wendy Maldonado D'Amico. I'm part of the Accelerate Yale team. I just wanted to thank Dan and Tom for joining us today and for Adam leading the conversation. We're so grateful to you both. This is absolutely fascinating. And for everyone who tuned in uh, and who was not able to tune in, you will find the upload of this webinar on our YouTube channel and we will send it out to everyone who registered. Thank you so much, everybody. Cool, thank you. Thanks everyone for, for coming. Okay. Time. This was a lot of fun. Excellent. Thanks, guys. <laughs> right. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Dr. Rabbit. <laughs>